Hey, this is John, and this video is for Bible believers that feel that the Mandela Effect is an absolute impossibility because you believe that God's Word teaches that the Scriptures cannot be changed. This is typically known as the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. And I and many believers in the Mandela Effect community held this view as you did right up until the time we saw the Bible was changing and so we had to go back into the Word and find out how this could be. Because if it's changing, the Bible must, must not be teaching that it will never change. It, it does appear to be teaching that, that the Bible will never change, but upon closer examination, I believe I'll be able to show from Scripture that the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture is not quite what we have been led to believe by well-meaning Bible scholars. Uh, but before I go into my proof texts for this position, I just feel prudent to give a few examples of why I believe the Bible is changing. I've covered these in other videos, but I'm just going to summarize them. You know, what proof do I really have the Bible is changing? Why, 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 why? Why would I have the unmitigated audacity to suggest such a horrible heresy? I mean, think of all the stories of people, what they've gone through to rely on the Word of God, to preserve the Word of God, to endure the torture and, and just unimaginable stories around what really is the centerpiece is the integrity of the Word of God. And what a fearful thing to be a man that would make this kind of case to impugn the very integrity of the Word of God. I mean, what would God do with such a vile enemy, such a man that claims to fear God as I do, would have to be either completely insane or be in possession of some very compelling evidence. And so I and many others have provided ample evidence in other videos, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but this topic is so sensitive that I felt it imperative just to sprinkle in a few Bible changes here in the beginning of why I believe this is happening. But it's not just these changes. It's the ones, you know, in the cultural, you know, movie lines, anatomy, geographical changes, all different topics. Um, it's really it's really an astounding event. Uh, there's no question how, how widespread it is. Well, let's take a look at some of these passages. Of course, the most famous one is Isaiah 11.6. And again, you have to look at the possibility of going to a hundred presidents of Bible schools that have never heard of the Mandela Effect. And just ask them this question. Ask a hundred theologians. I've seen them on videos being asked for the first time. Bible scholars. Who laid down with the lamb? They... They think about it for a second and they all say, the lion, like 100% of them. <laughs> and then they open their Bible, of course, and it says wolf. And off you go into this bizarre scrambling to try to explain, give some commentary for why you're finding something you weren't expecting to find. And I believe at that moment, God is testing the hearts of men and women in this last hour to see if they will choose knowing God over knowing their Bible. So, please, 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 let's not try to suggest that the human memory cannot be trusted, that this is Saul somehow, some mass misremembering. It's really a lie. And I'm, I've shown that convincingly in numerous videos. I'm going to touch on it later, but it's just total nonsense, okay? Everybody listening to this can remember the street they grew up on, their kindergarten teacher, you know, their next door neighbor's name, their math tables, stuff from a long time ago, stuff from recent, stuff you talk about a lot, stuff you don't talk about a lot. I've heard all the arguments. The human memory is awesome. God commands us to remember things. So please, you know, we're, we're, we're asked to believe that the reason that people say lying is because of some twisted global telephone game mix-up 
where somewhere along the way some preacher misquoted Isaiah 11:6, and then that kind of went through the whole world. You know, the entire body of Christ is misquoting this. It's it's called an implanted thought or confabulation. It's nonsense. It's total nonsense. When you pile one on top of another on top of another, right? And, and this passage, which says wolf, is is in every translation. So it's not a translation mix-up. Well, it says lion over here, but not over here, and we're just referencing this version. No, it's every version. And another argument is it's a it's not a, a, a translation error, it's a version error. Uh, so, you know, I can quote it right from the 1611 Cambridge version. You can even go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, uh, very often critics will point to this as evidence that we are misremembering, but they just don't understand how exotic this phenomenon is. Because when a Mandela effect is recognized by the community, as, as you will see in a moment, I'm going to I'm going to name scriptures that you're going to get wrong. And you're going to have to decide how you're going to respond to that. Well, what what you find is that these changes didn't happen like a year ago or 10 years ago and before that it was line. No. The change goes back to the beginning of time. So it's much more unfathomable than you can ever wrap your mind around. History is literally changing. So there's all these different theories about what we're experiencing. You know, parallel universes, or we're on a different earth, or we've been you know, snatched out of our reality and put in, I don't, I don't claim to know how it's happening or what I'm experiencing, but I can tell you what I'm not experiencing is I'm not experiencing losing my keys, can't remember where I parked my car, or some little quirky misremembering. Negative. Okay? Negative. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. How many times did the cock crow, Pastor? Before Jesus, before Peter denied Jesus? Three? <laughs> no. It did say that one other trans in another gospel, but not in Mark. Is that the first time you've ever seen that? Hey, did Jesus ever baptize anyone to your recollection? 100 pastors? How about 100 out of 100 tell you no? What are you going to do then? Are you going to rationalize that away as, uh, you know, well, the Bible says uh, that, you know, it doesn't say that the love of money is the root of all evil. Or no, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. I know that. But I'm asking you if, for your knowledge, did Jesus ever baptize people? And if, if you say, oh, no, I don't believe I ever remember reading that. Well, how do you explain John 3.22 coming into your consciousness now for the first time in your entire walk with God? It's ridiculous. Judge not, lest ye be judged, does not appear in any translation. This is quoted by saint and sinner alike. And so again, when I have broached this with learned Bible believers, who I believe if they die, they go to heaven. I'm not saying if you don't believe this, you're going to hell. What I'm saying is that this is flying under the radar, and you better take this seriously because the evidence is overwhelming, okay? So again, we're told, oh, some, sometimes somebody preached it and misquoted it, and now, yeah, and now the whole world, you're out in the street preaching to sinners, and they're always going to tell you, hey, the Bible says judge not lest you be judged. It's in movies, it's in literature, but it's not anywhere in any Bible. So how come it's coming out of everybody's mouth? Misremembering? You know what my response to misremembering argument is? Yeah, if you say so. Okay, so you go to 50 presidents of Bible schools, 50 heads of the theological department, and ask them, Sir, uh, Madam, does the Bible anywhere insinuate, indicate 
even subtly or make a possible reference to female angels? And of course, 100 out of 100 will tell you no. No, the, the Bible has always revealed angels to be male. However, what we now have in the book of Zechariah is a reference to two women and the wind was in their wings and they had wings like the wings of a stork. So again, you can try to ramble on down the road of some commentary to explain this away, but I'm asking you a different question. I'm asking you, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the truth revealer, is this the first time that you have ever been, that this has ever come into your consciousness, that there is a passage in your Bible that seems to reference, even subtly, women angels? Well, they're not angels. Okay, women with wings. <laughs> Lifting up the ephah. You ever seen this before? How, how do you explain that? How do you explain these names in your Bible and you've never seen them before? Now, maybe you have. I didn't. I've, I've heard of Mephibosheth, but not these other people. Hela Kamakazuka. Barabuka Bambo. Bam, bing, boom. I mean, come on, man. Look at these things. They're outrageous. Chepharharamaramoni. You know, you just, you think you would remember these guys if they were ever in your Bible. <clears throat> How about Daniel? And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, did you know Daniel was a president? And I mean, if you do, maybe, you know, maybe we are from another universe, because I didn't know that. And then, of course, people started reading their Bibles, and in Matthew 9, it's now referencing bottles instead of wineskins which first of all makes no sense, right? Because the whole idea is that the wineskins can burst because they're made of, you know, skin. And if the wine ferments and it could boom, right? Well, a bottle's not gonna boom, but that's not the point. The point is I have a memory, okay? I know my next door neighbor's name. I know my math tables. I know the street I grew up on, okay? I know my Bible and my memory is admissible in a court of law, can put people in prison for their life. It is not nothing. And so I don't remember bottles. Bottles doesn't make sense. And we also have residual evidence in the form of the commentaries in the back referencing wineskins, while the passage in the Bible that it came from says bottles. So that tells you right there that if something's rotten in Denmark, Okay, and then of course, we have the great parable about building your house on the rock or on the sand. But now we have Luke 6, which tells us that some fools built their house on the earth. And did the winds blow against their house? No, the stream did. I'm begging you, okay? I'm begging you to take this seriously because this is absolutely happening. And I'm gonna show you all of the scriptures that you need to know that God did allow this, because that's the problem that you have, okay? The problem that you have is you have a doctrine that says this can't be happening, but your doctrine is incorrect. I'm just to say it plainly, I don't mean any disrespect, but I'm gonna back that up here in a minute. Okay, but here what we're starting to see are passages which seem to clearly be unlike God. So this is now the voice of the stranger this is, this is doctrine that's inconsistent with the nature and character of God and his divine perfections. Hosea 4, 14, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. Please spare me the commentaries about why this is supposed to be this way, because in the aggregate, I don't agree. Okay? 2 Corinthians 11, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Uh, Proverbs 26.10, the great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. Well, he rewards them with punishment. No, it doesn't say that. Okay, if I'm a fool and I'm a transgressor, I'm going to draw strength from this passage. I'm going to go to my pastor and say, hey, I like this God. This is, this is all right. I'm going to go do some more transgression and get rewarded. Right? And then, of course, 2 Corinthians 
11.4 tells us that we should bear with the person preaching false doctrine. Okay, Numbers 11.12, have I begotten them that they should have say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child. Now, if that doesn't rub you the wrong way, I don't think I can help you. Okay, this is unnatural, and it's it's sliding us into a LBGT world where all of this kind of stuff is going to be accepted. It's all going to be in your Bible. It's all happening in your face, but it's under your nose. Okay, Isaiah 60 says, Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shall suck the breast of kings. And, you know, it's outrageous to read that and not be shocked by it. But that's exactly what we're witnessing with men and women of God who don't want to believe that it's happening because of the ramifications of it and because they have a doctrine that says it can't happen. So they have eyes to see, but they see not. Luke 17, I tell you, in that night, there shall be two women in one bed. I'm sorry, there'll be two men in one bed. That scripture has been changed. It was two men in a field, not two men in a bed. So again, this is giving strength to the enemy. All right, some some very odd scriptures uh, and a little quiz. Okay, you've read the Bible for 50 years. You don't read the Bible. You meditate on the Bible. You memorize the Bible. You live in the Bible. How many times does your Bible use the term pisseth against the wall? That would be something that you would probably have in your consciousness, and that it's in there. Did you, did you know it was in there six times? There's the passages. How about unicorns? How many times does your Bible mention unicorns? Zero, one, two. How about nine? Did you know that your Bible mentions unicorns nine times? Does the King James Version of the Bible mention men eating their own dung and drinking their own piss? Yes, it does. Isaiah 36, 12. You might not be put off by that, but I am. We see that the Bible names are changing. The first book of Samuel, otherwise called the first book of the Kings. Well, since when? I mean, I never know. I never remember that. The first book of the Kings commonly called the third book of the Kings. No, my Bible did not commonly call Kings the third book of Kings. Okay, so I'm just I'm just funny. I just trust my memory and my conscience. And you can cite all the TED Talks you want. I've got way more data to prove that the memory is very reliable. Okay. So this passage is very compelling that God told them that they can sacrifice a pigeon or a turtle dove, but if they couldn't afford to, they could sacrifice a lamb, but if they couldn't afford it, they could actually do a pigeon or a turtle dove. But then in the same passage, the same paragraph, a few lines later, and if you be not able to bring a lamb, then shall then she shall bring two turtles, okay? Now, these two words, turtle dove and turtle, are the exact same word in the concordance, same concordance number, okay? And when I've shown this to pastors, they've tried to suggest that these two words, the way they were translated, are uh, interchangeable, right? Turtle dove and turtle are interchangeable, like 12 and a dozen, right? They're two different words, but they mean the same thing. But... 12 and a dozen do mean the same thing, but turtle and turtle dove do not, okay? A turtle dove is a bird, and a turtle is a reptile. So they're not interchangeable. It is the same word. The translators translated them two different things, which would not happen. And the definition from the dictionary, the lexicon, which is a dictionary, doesn't mention a turtle or a reptile. It is a bird. So this is clear, in my opinion, very clear evidence that the Bible has been tampered with. Okay? This really put a lot of people back on their heels. Take up thy bed, 
and walk and they open their Bible one day and it says couch and the couch wasn't even invented till 1895 Acts 12:4 now refers about to Easter it should say Passover uh, Revelation 1 6 and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father this seems to indicate that God has a father and then of course one of the most compelling arguments is that the King James Version is filled with punctuation, spelling, and grammatical errors pretty much on every page. And I'm taking these here pointing to the 1611 version. So it's not, um, you know, a version issue. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, uh, but you can do the research for yourself. But you can see that the words are capitalized following a comma or a period even. And you can try to suggest that that part is a quote, that's why it's capitalized, but it also does it when it's not a quote. And the other argument is that, well, that's just King James language, right? And the way they translated it to English. And that's total nonsense. It has nothing to do with reality because first of all, I have lists of books that are written in the style of the King James language. It's, you know, these are literary masterpieces. They're not looking like they're written by fifth graders, which is what the King James Version looks like now. You read through these these books, the American Revolution, right? It reads beautifully. The punctuation is impeccable, right? All of the punctuation is impeccable. So don't blame it on the King James language because it's not that. And in fact, history shows that these King James uh, versions from 1611 went through went through comprehensive grammatical changes to get them accurate to the English language. These people are not fools that wrote these Bibles and translated them and then, you know, have subsequently gone through quality control to standardize the spelling to match that of English. They wouldn't have missed all of these punctuation errors, okay? So I'm going to stop there as far as examples of why we believe we can point to specific changes in the Bible. There's so many more, but that's not the purpose of this, this video. So what conclusion do I draw from this? Well, one is that I'm compelled to become a heretic <laughs> because the definition of a heretic is one who differs in opinion from an accepted belief or doctrine. And of course, you're in good company, historically, if you're a heretic. Many true Bible believers ended up being burned at the stake because they refused to renounce the teachings of Scripture and kiss the Pope's ring. And so, however, many people would prefer not to be burned at the stake. So I believe that this this problem that you enter into if you embrace these glaringly obvious proofs is that most Christians and church leaders won't do it or they're unable or unwilling to see the changes because if you embrace the concept that reality is changing or our memories are somehow correctly indicating that something unexplainable is happening then you too would be a heretic because one of the things that's changing is the Bible and so your mind and your subconscious won't allow that. People are typically not going to agree to something that goes against their values and beliefs. So what must first happen if you're going to be able to see this is you must get permission to see. You must get permission from yourself to see. It's a normal response to information that conflicts with long-held beliefs. Psychologists call this cognitive dissonance. And, of course, biblical orthodoxy seems to indicate that God's word will never change. That's what I've always believed for over 30 years, walking with the Lord. And so many believers are experiencing what you see on the screen here. Now, let me give an example of what this is like. Imagine if the police came to my door and they told me that my son was being arrested for murder. And you know what I'd tell them? I'd say, you know what, you got the wrong house. And then they give me my son's name, excuse me, and the proof. And they said, we have proof. 
And you know what I'd tell him? I'd say, I don't care what proof you have. I know my son. And see, this is exactly where I believe most Christians are coming from. Because they're not going to accept the Mandela effect. You know, their subconscious is screaming at them. Because it's saying, you know, I know my Bible and I know God and it'll never change and God would never change. So it goes right in the delete file without any you know, serious consideration. Uh, but the problem is, as I see it, is you really only got that half right. Okay, Your doctrine is only half right. Because God is immutable. That's for sure. You can't scratch God's throne. All right, He ain't changing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Scripture absolutely is divinely inspired, but he put that curse in Revelation 22 on anyone that would change the Bible for a reason. He knew this was coming, as we're going to see in this video. He told Daniel, he told John the Revelator, he told Paul the Apostle, he told Enoch, all of them about the Mandela effect. And he's about to tell you if you have ears to hear and eyes to see. The scriptures describe this event with stunning accuracy. And so when I first saw this phenomenon, I told God I wouldn't believe it unless I sh could see it in the word of God. Unless I could see this in the scriptures, I wasn't going to believe it, even though I saw it with my own eyes. So if you're like me, it won't matter what evidence you're shown like in the beginning there you'll be able to find a reason for every one of those scriptures because you have a doctrine that says the Bible can't change. So why would you waste your time researching this? It would be like someone suggesting there's no God. You know, as believers, we all have a like a filter for that. If you're on the street evangelizing and the atheist comes up, you know, and he says, ah, oh, there's no God, bam, right in the spam filter. I mean, you're not even considering it. It's not an option, right? And all you're looking to do is debunk it. But what you're probably unaware of is that there are passages in the Bible that describe this event and provide that doctrinal permission, so to speak, for you to be able, you know, with enough exposure to the evidence to have to embrace this and really this concept, okay, of one of many. Here's an idea. If the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture is true, and I believe, I believe it is and has been, but I also believe that there has been a time limit on it, which most are unaware of. I also believe it's improperly defined, which I'll share later in the video. But on this topic of, of there being sort of an addendum to this, in, in other words, it was only, the preservation of scripture was only designed to, to last until the end days before Jesus comes, an event before the um, final wrap-up, okay? So there would be a period of time when the preservation of Scripture would be lifted. God's providence to protect it would be lifted. And I'll show that from the Scripture. At which point, God lifts his hedge around this book of books, the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, and allow the usurper to use whatever means he is using. I don't know, to be able to supernaturally change not the word of God, which is Jesus, but the terrestrial Bible. Not the words from the original autographs that were divinely given to the original authors, then written on parchments and divinely preserved and then sewn into the hearts of men and women through the thousands of years. Those words hidden in our hearts cannot be changed. That's why we can remember the lion laid down with the lamb so vividly because the enemy can't take what has been given to us, only fiddle with the prime material plane. And, you know, don't let, don't shut me off yet, okay? Because I haven't gotten to the evidence. I'm just trying to lay a foundation here because what I'm going to show you, I believe, is pretty compelling. And God help me if I'm wrong. All right, but God help you if you're wrong. I suggest you go along for the ride. See, see, I'm going to show you from your own Bible. I think you'll be surprised. 
So what I'm going to show is that biblical orthodoxy and biblical prophecy do in fact support the claim by many believers that the Bible is being supernaturally changed. It's being changed and it was prophesied that it would be changed. This is not mass misremembering, but it is an end time sign and wonder that was clearly foretold and it's happening right under your nose. So you might say, so let me get this straight. So for hundreds of years, the greatest minds in Christendom have not been able to hear from God. But you come along and you can come to this conclusion and you're right and they're wrong. Is that what you're telling me? Well, yes. Because uh, really it would be almost impossible for one to come to this conclusion without first having these changes start to happen and then to following to be persuaded that these changes were happening and then having the context to go back into the word to see if this event had been described this i believe is what god meant when daniel said shut up the words until the time of the end see the shutting up that god was talking about would be man's inability to decode what the prophecies were saying until one was experiencing the end time event that the prophecies were talking about. What, you know, how would you possibly come to this conclusion unless you were seeing it happen first? You'd have to have some context in order to come back into the word and reverse engineer the meaning, not twist the scripture to fit my delusion, okay? But to see if what I'm clearly seeing is described in the Bible which it is, sort of like a map legend or a keystone. Because it appears that the widespread awareness of this event only began as early as July 2016, and maybe some saw changes before that, but research shows almost no interest in this topic prior to that date, which, by the way, is the exact date that the Hedron Collider uh, announced that they were turning up the uh, system to full power, July 2016. Interesting coincidence. And I treat that whole thing in another video on my channel, Wake Up or Else. So if it is a recent event, there would have to be, you know, there would be no catalyst to come to this doctrinal position. So yeah, I believe that the uh, theologians of all time wouldn't know this because uh, they didn't live when I lived. And the devil is subtle. He wants you to embrace this and teach these changes to your congregation and wear out the saints. He wants you to go along with the changes, gradually taking you farther and farther away from who God is until you're led right into the one world religion with the AC on the throne. Everything to support his claims will be right in your Bible. All kinds of foul agendas and foul doctrine are already there. I shared a few of them. Sucking men's breasts for milk? Come on. Unicorns? I mean, it's off the charts. I, I mean, I touched a percent of the changes. Many are going to fall from this. And if you're a pastor, it'll be your fault for not taking this seriously. So, you know, the inability combined with the unwillingness to see these changes for what they are is really more mystifying to us than the phenomenon itself. And the phenomenon is very mystifying. <laughs> Somehow, the majority of Christians have not been able to properly discern this event. And so, although these changes are so numerous, they're glaring, they're painfully obvious to those of us who are claiming this to be you know, unexplainable, they're still subtle enough to fly under the radar to the casual observer. So, you know, a glaring example, for instance, would be if you woke up and John 3.16 said, God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten daughter. Er, hit the brakes, what? Every translation references daughter? What planet am I on, right? You'd be leveled. Well, aggreg aggregately, that's what we're experiencing. Your whole world would come crashing down as ours has. The great deceiver isn't going to do that for you, though. He wants you to willingly accept him. So he's going to make it subtle enough 
where you can ignore your own vivid memory and violate your conscience and deny that anything is happening. Because see, if John 3.16 changed like that, so overtly, everybody would be forced to admit this deception was taking place and it would backfire. Because you know God didn't send his only begotten daughter. So you'd jump ship. You'd become a heretic like us because your conscience would require you to. Well, it's requiring you to now, but you're just ignoring it. So I'm just using an overt example to make my point. I'm not saying that John 3.16 has changed that way. It has changed. It, it says should instead of shall now, which is not as definitive. Anyway, if you went to every translation, including the 1611, and it said daughter, and every translation said daughter, and you'd be forced to admit something was explainable is happening. If you went to the commentaries, and they're talking about how God sent his daughter in glowing terms, you'd be like, what planet am I on? What is going on? Well, that's our world. It's just so incongruous. It's so separated from what you know. Your mind is blown. Because you know God didn't send his daughter. Your memory's screaming at you. You don't care what anybody says. You know what you know. I mean, don't Christians say that? How do you know you're saved? I know that I know that I know. Well, why do you keep telling us we're misremembering? Stop doing that, okay? I'm not misremembering. God doesn't allow me to say shut up because it's not Christ-like. So I have to come up with another term for those of you that keep suggesting that we're misremembering. I'll find one, Lord willing. So, I agree that he's not going to allow what he has spoken to be changed. The devil can't take that from me. Okay? The fact that the lion laid down with the lamb. I have to relinquish that of my own free will. Because you know and I know that the lion laid down with the lamb. Okay? Don't tell me that the wolf laid down with the lamb. I just asked a pastor who's been pastoring 40 years. He has a church of 500. I known this man for years. I called him up and said, Pastor, you ever hear a Mandela effect? Uh, no. It's one of the sweetest men of God I ever met. I said, Pastor, would you tell me from your memory, who laid down with the lamb? He said, the lion. He didn't even hesitate, baby. I said, Pastor, could you get a Bible? You got a Bible near you? He had to walk back inside. He got this Bible. He opened that baby up, and it said wolf. And all I could hear was silence. He read it, and then I was just silence. I, I just let it sit there. I let it sit there in the air for a second. And this is what I said. I said, Pastor. <laughs> I said, Pastor, does that rub you the wrong way, man? <laughs> I said, man, that rubs me the wrong way, doesn't it? That's not right. He said, John, this is not right. I can't explain this. Stop lying to yourself, man. Something is going on. I mean, you can't explain God. You can't explain who God is. You can't explain the kingdom of God, angels and miracles, and yet you have this naturalistic worldview that says, oh, this is impossible. Shame on you. You know who I am? I'm Rhoda. I'm knocking on your door, man, and I'm telling you something supernatural is changing. You know what they told Rhoda? They said, Rhoda, you're crazy. You need to repent. I'm not telling you you're going to hell because you don't believe this, but I am telling you you're in a perilous spiral. And you're certainly going to be held accountable for the people that you're not warning. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But the flip side of this is if you're seeing these proof texts and you're starting to see the scriptures I'm going to share with you and you are like us and you reluctantly concede, as many of us have, you're going to be on the horns of a dilemma because the ramifications of this, what God is allowing in his infinite wisdom are so dire and so disturbing and so unraveling. You know what you're going to be like? This is what God showed me. You're going to be like this guy right here. You know who that is? That's the rich young ruler. 
He served the Lord, man. Said from the, my youth up, I have kept the commandments. <laughs> but what do I lack? And Jesus told him, you got to give up the money, bro. He was like, whoa. He said, whoa, that's, that's, that's too much. And he went away very sad. Well, our Bibles have become an idol, just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't even have a clue who Jesus was, but they knew their Bibles. And so Jesus is coming to his church, and he's allowing what is pointing to him to be tampered with, to see if his people know him. You know how many people are in hell that can quote the scriptures up one side and down the other? And so, in a way, I'm not saying the Bible is a big mess. I, I prayed Ephesians 1, 4, 5, and 6 this morning, and I had a feast at the table. Who I am in Christ. I have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, man. God's word is rich. It's a bounty but it's being tampered with. And you better wake up and understand that God is trying to get our attention. But the consequences are going to flood you with questions. How could God allow this? What about, doc what about doctrine? What about evangelism? What about discipleship? What about obedience to God? Well, if he says this over here, how can he let... I'm going to get to that, all right? I'm not saying we don't need the word. I'm not... I'm not, I'm not proposing any extra biblical revelation or we don't need the word of God. I'm just reporting on what God is allowing, okay? You could draw your own conclusions. There's still great sustenance and guidance and blessing, but we cannot make ourselves smarter than God. And God is allowing this. And there is hope and there is a blessing in this. But this is unprecedented. I mean... You know, I've addressed this challenge of how are we supposed to respond to this in this video here, walking with Jesus through the Mandela effect. I encourage you to listen to that. So this is a hard thing to deal with for most. And you know, how do you tell your congregation without having them fall away? You know, think of the new Christian, the old Christian, any Christian. And we've talked to pastors and deacons who understand this is happening. They don't deny it, but they were told us straight up, we were not going to tell our congregation. We're like, you got to be kidding me. I don't think those people, I mean, I don't know how God is going to deal with that, but I believe they've relinquished their mantle of a shepherd and become a hireling. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to judge people, but this is... This is big time. This is the big leagues. So, certainly I believe it's a catalyst, possibly a centerpiece for the great falling away. Certainly going to wear down the saints, like Daniel talked about. You know, if you're getting mad at me, suggesting that I'm causing it by disseminating this heresy, you got the wrong guy. Okay, God told us there would be a great falling away. He told us there would be a famine of the word in Amos. I'm not causing it. I'm just reporting on it, trying to help you avoid it. See, it's a, it is a deception, but not for those of us that are concluding that it's an exotic event. The deceived ones are those that are lying through their teeth to themselves to protect their pet doctrines and their paychecks and their security. It's certainly one of the things that Jesus was specifically warning about when he talked about the very elect being deceived, I'm witnessing that right now. I'm witnessing men of God that are way more godly than I am that somehow get agitated and reactionary and irrational when approached about this topic. You know, I'll show them, hey, who laid down with the lamb? They'll say the lion. We open the book. And when they see wolf, this this thing comes over them. It's like they're bewitched. It's really bizarre. And then they get real aggressive. And then they try start trying to convince themselves and me that they'd always said wolf. Right after they told me it was a lion. 
I don't know, man. Something's going on that's unexplainable. Mind control. It's not us that's mind control. We're, our eyes are open. And, uh, you know, I'm not just twisting the scriptures to fit my delusion. And those scriptures have any private interpretation. But, you know, you should just see what I'm going to show you before you jump off here, right? This, this study here is 48-minute Bible study. I did on some of these passages. I'm just going to summarize here. Uh, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail in this next piece, but this conversation needs to begin by addressing what biblical orthodoxy is surrounding the preservation of Scripture. In other words, in this doctrine, what we're told is, is the Bible will never change. But are there any controversies or dissenters within orthodoxy uh, regarding that doctrine? I will show that there is. And so as I began this study, I found that very learned, godly people that were teaching this uh, were talking about a variety of things in their arguments. And the idea that the scriptures are being preserved includes uh, all of these topics and more. Um, inspiration of scripture, right? It's God breathed, the immutability of God the inerrancy and accuracy of scripture, the canon, and then manuscripts and translation stuff, and all of those things go into the doctrine of the preservation of scripture. It essentially, is what we have today accurate to the original autographs? That's the, the real center, center point of the argument. You know, because we believe that the original autographs were the most inspired. So God gives Moses the words, you know, the Ten Commandments on the tablet, that was from God to man. And it's exactly what God gave man, right? And then down through the ages, it didn't change. That's basically the uh, the intent of the doctrine, right? So, we know inspiration of Scripture, but that's not really saying that the Bible won't change or Scripture won't change. It's saying that it was not written by men. Okay, so again, this doesn't really argue the point, but we know that the Bible is clearly not written by men. It's only penned by them. It's God's love letter to his children, and it's a call to come to him. It's a warning to fear him. It's, you know, he's holy and we're not, and uh, he's provided a way for us to be restored to him, and many, many themes uh, the scriptures distinguish themselves from other holy books, accurately predicting the future 100% of the time. Uh, the coherence of the 66 books written by all these different authors over thousands of years, yet it reads like one book. And of course, devils and bad men, bad men didn't write it because it threatens them with hell. Angels and good men didn't write it because it claims to be written by God and good men and angels wouldn't lie, right? So it has to be God-breathed. And of course, when you read the Bible, nobody could write these words that touch men's hearts. I remember this one guy who had gotten out of prison for murder. And, uh, you know, you would have trusted your kids with him to babysit him because God had changed his heart. And so we see the miraculous evidences that this is a book that comes from another dimension. We know it's not a book of literature. Um, the, the, the very words and thoughts of the invisible eternal God written down in a book. It's amazing, right? And it doesn't really bother me if atheists can find little insignificant inconsistencies, you know. Uh, after all, I mean, God chose imperfect men to write you know, to give the words to, and then imperfect men to record them and to preserve them. And so, you know, there may be some irrelevant anomalies. It doesn't bother me. What's been provided is sufficient. I certainly got saved when Pastor Green, 1983, preached for the Book of Romans. I got saved. Uh, having said that, there is ample evidence that the 1611 version is accurate to the original autographs that Moses and the prophets and the New Testament writers gave us. You know, I'm confident of that. I mean, we can debate that forever, but I, I mean, I'm basically, I'm a Bible believer. 
Okay, I believe God made Adam out of the dirt. And, uh, you know, I'm a fundamentalist. I'm a supernaturalist. Um, I'm trying to defend the, the doctrine that this is kind of a reformation of the preservation of Scripture. I'm suggesting that the doctrine of preservation of Scripture is not what we've been led to believe. And so as you start to listen to these Bible scholars, they will spend a significant amount of time trying to convince you about the mutability of God. But, you know, that God's the same yesterday and today and forever. But these passages of Scripture that they're pointing to are clearly talking about God and not really clearly talking about the Scriptures themselves. Um, so again, I don't question the immutability of God, but in the light of the Mandela effect, I definitely question the immutability of the scriptures. And so as you listen to different Bible teachers, uh, talk about the preservation of scripture, you're going to hear much discussion about history, about the canon, about the different translations, about the original manuscripts and which version of the manuscript was used. And when you listen to these Biblical patriarchs debate each other. Most of the time, they're unable to agree on many of the points themselves. And you think, well, these guys can't agree. You know, what are us mere mortals supposed to do? So my point here is that, you know, most Christians are going to go to heaven never fully understanding the majority of this topic. <laughs> it's very complicated. And it, it requires a variety of daisy-chained arguments to make its case. And, you know... They also delve into uh, the main topic, which is the accuracy and inerrancy of Scripture. Okay, so these two topics are at the heart of our discussion, and, and they differ vastly from the arguments surrounding inspiration of Scripture and immutability of God. It's God breathed, and God doesn't change. Okay, no one's arguing those two things. Accuracy specifically speaks to the idea that what we possess today are the same writings as the original authors penned on their parchments. Inerrancy is a bit more broad, but has a similar connotation to accuracy. Inerrancy also addresses contradictions within Scripture, historical accuracy, and its overall trustworthiness. Primarily, is it inerrant to the original manuscripts because we believe that those originals were inspired by God? So if what we have been given, corrupted over time, then we don't have something that's inspired anymore, right? Is it different from what we were originally given? And until the Mandela effect asserted itself, I personally believed that the scriptures could be trusted and that they were accurate to the original manuscript, but that no longer is the case for me. And so Peter wasn't kidding when he said in the end days, perilous times will come. So a lot of people reject this event because of its ramifications. But all that is is cowardice. You don't love the truth because it's staring you in the face and you're rejecting it. For many, the Bible has become an idol and God is trying to wake you up and call you to himself, just like he did the Pharisees. He told them that they could not find eternal life in the scriptures. He told them that eternal life was in him. And no, I'm not suggesting you don't need the Bible. We just need Jesus. I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is the Bible is being manipulated using some fallen angel technology, and you're going to have to figure out how you're going to respond to that. So in this next section, I'm going to show scriptures and prophecies that seem to show that the, ME, the Mandela effect was foretold. And then we'll look at scriptures that seem to indicate the Bible will never change. And perhaps these passages are really speaking about Rhema words of God as originally given to Bible authors and recorded on paper and then in men's hearts. Okay? In other words, when God told Isaiah to write, the lion will lay down with the lamb, he recorded it, and for thousands of years men read it and it was sown in their hearts. Then God's enemy came along and changed what's written on the paper, but not in our hearts. And so we're like Job that have a hedge around us. That's what these passages are promising will never change. God's words as originally given and recorded and now stored in our hearts. It has to be because the scriptures are changing. So 
let's begin with Revelation 22. And just in summary, because I've already gone through these in detail for almost an hour in another video. I'm not going to get into detail in the context here, so please don't comment on that. If I'm rightly dividing the passages or not, you'll have to listen to the other Bible study on my website or my YouTube channel. Okay, so first of all, real quick, Revelations 22, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. The word seal, Strong's 4972, is a seal for security from Satan. Okay, so reading that in context, this passage reads as follows. He saith unto me, protect not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Protect not from Satan the prophecy of the book. Do not protect the Bible from Satan. God has lifted the protection of the Bible from Satan in this last hour. Okay? We can, we can go into this in detail on, on my other study and pick it apart, but that appears to be what this passage is referencing. I know it says the prophecy, so you might want to suggest it's only the book of Revelation. I know that you could divide this in many different ways, but I'm just giving you a glimpse of some of the passages that we're looking at that seem to indicate that this is foretold in the scriptures, okay? And of course, Revelation 22, a little later on, talks about if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. So again, God's very touchy about having someone change his book. Maybe he did that because he knew it was going to happen. Daniel 12, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Okay, now I always thought that was when Jesus came. Now I believe it is the time of the end before Jesus came, which we are now in. Because it says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. So, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. As I mentioned before, I believe this is referencing the fact that you couldn't possibly understand that this was going to happen until it was happening. So now it's being unsealed. And of course, we have Daniel 7, which, before I go on, this is basically, as I'm going to reference later, this is one of the addendum scriptures. This passage here modifies the doctrine of the preservation of scripture. Okay, It gives the preservation of scripture a time limit, so to speak. Okay, and We'll come back to that later in context. Daniel 7, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Now, the commentaries on this are going to give this a much more naturalistic treatment. But if you have a supernaturalist view of this, times are talking about the space-time continuum, and what we're seeing with this Mandela effect or quantum effect is all of history is flip-flopping around. It's absolutely mind-boggling. And then, of course, laws... In one of the uh, uh, lexicon or, or versions of that, it means the law of God. And so it says it, it couldn't be clearer. You now have two passages. One that says, don't protect the Bible from Satan. Another one that says that the enemy of God will seek to change the Bible. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. It says it. So there it is in the lexicon, the law of God. Amos was given a prophecy, which I treat at length. There is even a celestial event that has now happened that confirms this is an end times event. And it's saying that there's going to be a famine of the word of God in the land. And it's clearly a famine of the word that's not like regional. It's all over. they are wander from sea to sea and from north, even to the east. They'll run to and fro, to seek the word of the Lord, shall not find it. This is happening in modernity, okay? This was foretold. So we're not just kooks, you know, trafficking in the dark corners of the internet in our mom's basement. We're not biblically illiterate, okay? We're not misremembering. 
We're not heretics. Well, actually, I take that back. We are heretics and proud of it, okay? Because, as I mentioned, the celestial event has confirmed Amos. The sky was darkened. It's actually happened numerous times recently. Um, and then, of course, Enoch, who was so godly, God couldn't take it anymore, and snatched him up without even dying. Enoch, who is quoted in the book of Jude, although he wasn't canonized, the fact that the biblical author quotes him confirms that the book, at the very least, is a prophetic book. It says this, and in the days of the sinners, because in the beginning of Enoch, it says, this book is not for you. It's for the people that will live in the end days. So this is speaking to us. In the days of the sinners, the years shall be shortened and their seeds shall be tardy on their lands and the fields and fields and all things on the earth shall alter and shall not appear in their time. What was Enoch describing? Well, it sounds exactly like the Mandel effect. Everything is altering. South America, to most people, has shifted 30 degrees to the uh, east. <laughs> there was a giant island off the coast of Australia that's not there anymore, but it, it pops up in residual evidence. People's anatomy is different. Names, places, spellings, movie lines, book names changed. Mirror, mirror on the wall has never existed. It's always been magic mirror on the wall. Well, that's easy to get that wrong. No, it's not. No, it's not. You're a liar. <laughs> because I listened to a psychologist that did a study with 25,000 respondents. Anything over 5% is considered a statistical anomaly. In other words, if 25,000 people misremember mirror, mirror on the wall, over 5% of them, that becomes an anomaly. You know how many people misremembered it and said it was mirror, mirror? 95%. So don't tell me that it's normal for 95% because you're statistically wrong it's an absolute phenomenon. I'm sorry, I'm getting upset because this is really happening, okay? Look at what he says next. And the rain shall be kept back and the heavens shall withhold it. And in those times, the fruits of the earth shall be backward. Well, one of the known Mandel effects that came out was that bananas now grow upside down. And to a lot of people, this looks ridiculous. This is nothing like what we vividly remember, right? Bananas grow upside down. Now, let me show you again what Enoch said. And in those times, the fruits of the earth shall be backward. <laughs> I'm telling you, we are not just pulling this stuff out of thin air. We have done our homework. And we're looking at biblical prophecy and extra biblical prophecy being fulfilled. Believer. Bible believer, supernaturalist believer. Come on, man. Look at that. Enoch walked with God and then was not. Anyway. Well, the devil doesn't have that kind of power. Yes, he does. Because God's granting it to him. And it was given unto him, the enemy of God, to make war with the saints. Well, that sounds... Uh, like he's been given some power, and to overcome them. The power was given over all kindreds and tongues. And then he says, and doth great wonders, so he maketh fire to come down. There's other wonders, though. But then this is the topper. This is the big kahuna. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So when I read this in the context of this event, I was flabbergasted because I always held God to be the only one who had all power. But yet here we have that description of the enemy of God having all power. Well, the Mandela effect would certainly fit that description. Right? Who is like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? Well, if you can fiddle with history and your anatomy and you know 
geography, uh, you know, that would certainly fall into that category. All right, and so as I started to go down this road, um, I started to look for orthodoxy. And if there were people in orthodoxy that did not embrace the doctrine of the uh, preservation of Scripture. So I found this gentleman, Don Stewart, educatingourworld.com. He's written a, a number of books, uh, reached all over. His conclusion is there is no providential preservation taught in Scripture. Right, this is not his conclusion. He's saying that there are, are two schools and uh, one is that it's not taught, and one is that it is. And so, long story short, those who argue against the Bible teaching the providential preservation of Scripture make the distinction between the divine inspiration of Scripture and its providential preservation. They claim that there is nothing in, in the doctrine of the divine inspiration that necessitates that the Scripture be providentially preserved. The text used by those who claim scripture does not indeed teach providential preservation have been either misunderstood or misused. This is now my position. And I believe that I'm about to show this convincingly. Okay, I don't believe God can change or does change, but I think that the scripture can change and is changing. So you see these passages, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. These are the types of scriptures that are being used to put forth the idea that the scripture cannot change. What I'm going to show is that there is a vast difference between this term, the word of our God or the word of God, and the scriptures. And therefore, they can't be used interchangeably. Okay, so first thing I started to see in this study was that, you know, I'm saying, okay, is there permission, God, for me to come to this conclusion? If the Bible seems to teach that it won't change, is there other teaching that will show me that it could change? Because I believe it is changing. And sure enough, I started to find scriptures that when they were given seemed to indicate that these proclamations were forever and permanent and should never be changed. But then, of course, under the new covenant, they were absolutely changed. So this sets a precedent. This sets an example. We're taking the full counsel of God and trying to rightly divide the word and to know God and to use the Bible to have a worldview and to walk in truth. And if I'm wrong, please, please email me. Let's have dialogue. Let's pick this apart together. Because see, the leadership of the body of Christ is strangely silent on this. So we're groping along here on our own trying to figure this out. So Leviticus 23 says, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Okay, now if I'm standing there, Moses has given me this, uh, I'm like, okay, uh, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to keep the feasts. But then, of course, if I'm standing in front of Paul in Colossians 2, and he's saying, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday, or a holy day, I mean. Well, you know, how am I now viewing Leviticus uh, 23? That seems to have been modified. Colossians 2 seems to modify or even annul Leviticus. And of course, you could spend a lifetime delving into why that is, but that's outside of the purview of this conclusion I'm trying to draw. What I'm trying to point out is that Scripture changes Scripture. And I'm going to take that principle and I'm going to apply it to all of the Scriptures that seem to be used to to suggest that the Bible cannot be changed. And I'm doing it in the sight of God and the fear of God and asking God to please show me if what I'm saying is true or not. 
All right. And Galatians 4 also says, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. You know, you don't need to follow the ceremonial law. What was said is no longer valid. Okay. And then, of course, David took bread under the ban. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord. So here is an example of the scripture being violated in a sense and is sanctioned because a higher law of the right to life transcended the ceremonial law. And so we have scripture, Jesus, pointing out that scripture, the ceremonial law, was being transcended. Okay, just, just showing examples of this principle before I come to my conclusion about this. Scripture changing scripture. Okay? Here's another one. Or here's a fuller explanation of this. Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet they're innocent? I tell you that something greater then the temple is here. If you had known that these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so I, I submit the son of man is the Lord of the Bible. If God wants to allow the Bible to be changed, he is sovereign and he will warn us as he has and he will allow it. Don't make yourself smarter than God. Hasn't God ever messed with your theology? He certainly has with mine. Here's another example, Galatians 2.11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Okay? But when I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So here's Scripture battling with Scripture. They're trying to trying to work out, you know, the new doctrine, how it's supposed to be. Peter's saying one thing. Paul's saying another thing. So I came up with my own version of this, right? This verse here, verse 14, Galatians 2.14. This is my version. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to their own memories and the voice of their own conscience, I said unto all Christians publicly, If thou, being a Christian, are told by your God over and over to remember, why do you believe that you can't do it? You're going to have to, you're going to have to repent of this lie that the human memory is so unreliable. And, and you're using that to dismiss this overwhelming evidence. Okay, because God would not command you, dear soul, to do something that you couldn't do. Let me tell you why I say that. Because in First Chronicles, God says, remember his covenant. In Isaiah 49, 15, he says, can a woman forget her nursing child? In John 16, he says, but these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember in Deuteronomy 8.18, but you shall remember the Lord your God. Now, how is God going to command you to do that if the human memory is so infallible or so unreliable? That's a problem for all the misremembering cheerleaders. First Chronicles 16.12, remember his wonderful deeds, which he has done. Deuteronomy 9.7, remember and do not forget how you provoke the Lord. Oh, gosh, I forgot I provoked you yesterday, God. Oh, and I provo Oh, and I forgot. No, you didn't forget. Your memory is fabulous. This is my body, which is done for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The entire foundation of communion has to do with human memory. Hebrews 10, but remember the former days. And, you know, this is so preposterous, this idea that we're misremembering and it's confabulation, it's implanted thoughts. So here's a question to prove this to you, okay? How often does the average person mix up their next door neighbor's name 
with the name of the guy down the street. Okay, so take a hundred normal average people that have lived in uh, in their house for ten years. Okay, and they have a neighbor on either side. Let's say the neighbor's name is Joe, and then there's another neighbor down the street named James. Okay, you got a hundred examples of that. Okay, here's my question: What percent of those hundred people? are misremembering their next door neighbor's name. In other words, his name is Joe, but they, they are misremembering and they think it's James, okay? Is it 100% of them are misremembering? No? How about 75%? You think, you think seven out of 10 have it mixed up? The guy's name is Joe, but they keep calling him James and they're like, and the guy's not saying anything, but no. Do you think it's half? What percentage of 100 people are misremembering their next door neighbor's name? And see, you don't even know. And But you do know that it's not even half. It's not even 25%. It's probably one or two out of 100. <laughs> and then, of course, I have tons of studies like this, long-term memory studies here. Results of the study showed that participants who were tested within 15 years of graduation were about 90% accurate in identifying names and faces. After 48 years, they were 80% accurate for verbal and 70% for visual. It's a lie. We summarily reject the idea that we're misremembering. Period. It's a lie. I don't care what TED Talk you quote. I don't care what... But you quote in the law that the witnesses, because guess what? You know what the law is? That human memory is admissible in court. If it was so unreliable, human memory would have been abolished 50 years ago. So has the scripture ever changed scripture? Jesus answered him, it is also written. So the devil quotes scripture and Jesus tweaks it for him. And we're going to, we're about to see that God has tweaked the promises that seem to be used to indicate that the word would never change. Jesus tweaked the meaning, right? Didn't he say that to the devil? Acts 18.26, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and they expounded unto him the way of God, more perfectly. So they had to tweak his understanding. Okay? Now, if you're a fundamentalist like I am, this passage could cause you some confusion. Of course, you could make the argument that this command should only apply to this specific book, like the commentary suggests, and not the whole Bible. And so there would be no contradiction. However, if that's true, then wouldn't you exegete these scriptures in the same way? If not, why not? So instead of calling me a heretic and a charlatan, I implore you to explain how 100 patriarch pastors will get 10 out of 10 scripture examples wrong, like I showed, and then explain why I'm not properly dividing the word to make my point. How am I twisting the scripture to fit my own deranged doctrine? How? Be specific. Okay? So... Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments. So if I'm standing there and Moses says, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, well, right then, whatever the date was, that's it. That's the end of the Bible. The commentaries say, that, you know, this maybe only applies to this book. Well, if you're going to do that there, then let's apply that to Psalms 119. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, but it only goes to that book. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. You know, I'm not really, I'm not really sure what I'm saying here. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm tr I'm groping here in the dark. I'm trying to. I'm trying to see if there's possibly a light at the end of the tunnel because what I know 
And what hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people know is that the Bible's changing. And you say, no, it's not. We say, yes, it is. And you say, no, it's not. And I say, yes, it is. And so I'm going in and I'm saying, okay, well, this Deuteronomy said at one point you shouldn't add to the word, but that would mean everything after Deuteronomy is not the word of God. If you want to be a literalist about it, so how do you then rightly divide uh, Psalms 119 and Isaiah 40? Okay, let me give you another example. This one's pretty compelling. Leviticus 3.17. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. In all your dwellings, you shall not eat any fat or any blood. Okay, so again, if I'm standing there, this one actually says, like, forever. Throughout your generations. Don't eat the fat. Well, of course, Romans 4 comes in and nullifies that completely. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean. That includes fat. All right, so again, you have scripture modifying or nullifying other scripture. So let's take a look at an example now that I've laid this foundation of a passage that sounds similar to Leviticus, the way it's talking, and another passage that could modify that. That's, um, you know, making making the case that this is allowed to happen. All right, so Psalms 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words like silver refined in a furnace on, on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them will you will guard us from this generation forever now that's a very central passage used to uh, teach the doctrine of the preservation of scripture okay and it's using this same type of terminology that it's to be enforced essentially through this generation forever just like leviticus was but leviticus was nullified so is it Okay, now just hear my heart, right? Is it feasible that if this Mandela effect is really happening, okay, let's just say hypothetically that I'm correct. You're, you're unconvinced, okay? But let's just say hypothetically that I am correct, that it is happening. Is this a fair application uh, of, of scripture to suggest that Daniel 7, which is speaking of a, of a future end time event, which it clearly is, there, that's treated in that other Bible study. This is clearly an end times prophecy. I'm not going to go into detail on that. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Modifying Psalms 12, just like Romans modifies Leviticus 3. That's my thesis. Okay, so if this passage here, which is probably the mother of all passages to teach preservation of Scripture, if this passage said this, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of letter will pass from the Scriptures until all is accomplished, I would not be making this video. I would not have a YouTube channel. Because... In fact, I would probably be backsliding because I would see the changes, yet I would see that the Bible clearly says that it can't change. But this doesn't say that. It doesn't say that the stroke or letter will pass from the scriptures. It says it, it won't pass from the law, which is the law and the prophets, which is the words of God given to the original authors, which were penned and then sewn into men's hearts and are still there. That will not change. Now, I have a few more points to make and then I will finish. This next one is actually a glaring example. You might think this is silly, okay? But the Bible is very cryptic and you know we're not given everything. You know, It's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to seek it out. And so 
what I'm just going to point out here is I have a very clear example of where God did not preserve the word of God and it was destroyed. Okay, it's in there. And so I'm going to pull it up and I'm going to show it to you. Okay, it's Exodus 34, 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, you know what, go ahead and make two more tables of stone. You know, like the first ones I gave you. And I'll write on those tables again, just like the first ones. Do you remember? Like the ones you broke. So what happened? Right? If God will always preserve his word, why did he allow Moses to break the first set of tablets? When they fell on the ground, they would have bounced like a rubber ball. Just saying. I know that's not going to sit, be very convincing, but you know, I'm just I'm just going through the word and I'm I'm seeing things. I'm like, well, that's interesting. So you know, let's just not let's not camp out on that one. All right. Uh, I don't want to use that one either. All right. So this one is helpful. Okay. So these are all the ways that the Bible refers to itself. Okay. And this brings clarity to this this next point, which is when these passages refer that the word of God will never change. We have seen the preacher hold the Bible up for generations saying, I hold in my hand the eternal word of God. No, you don't. Do you know what you're holding in your hand? You're holding the scriptures. And those two things are not the same. So the Bible refers to itself as the scriptures, the holy scriptures, the writings, that which is written. And then it refers to the word of God and the word. And then the sacred books, the scrolls, the law, the law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets, the oracles of God, the covenant, the books. Okay, and what I'm going to show is that there is a very clear distinction between the word and the word of God and the scriptures. And we must rightly divide this if we're going to be on the side of truth. We have to not be sloppy about our terminology. Okay. So if you read many examples of these different phrases as a group, you can get a better sense of that the intrinsic meaning of the phrase, the scriptures, is different from the phrase, the word of God, or the gospel, or other terms that are used to describe the book of books. Okay, so here's three examples of where the Bible uses the term, the gospel. Okay, Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Mark 13, and the gospel must first be published published as a Mandela effect, by the way, Act 14, and there they preached the gospel, okay? So it's called the gospel. Then it's also referred to as the scripture, Mark 12. And have you not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected? John 19, and these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, Romans 4. And what saith the scripture, okay? Then the Bible refers to the word of God. Mark 7, making the word of God of none effect. Luke 8, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Acts 6, and the word of God increased. Okay, so you have the gospel, you have the scriptures, you have the word of God. Are they all the same? Well, I submit that they're not the same. For instance, Acts 6 points out that the word of God increased. Well, that kind of jumped out at me. And started to think about that. And so I found that there was a distinction there. So I've seen passages where people's faith increased and where Jesus increased in wisdom and where the word of God increased, but not where the scripture increased. Can you see the difference? It doesn't seem to make as much sense if these two things, the scripture and the word of God, are interchangeable. And the scripture increased, doesn't appear in the Bible, and it doesn't seem to bear witness. And the word of God increased seems to be talking about something like its influence, its acceptance, its impact increased, right? And so the word of God here seems to have a more of a connotation of the kingdom of God. The word of God is the power of God and the person of Christ being revealed. Paul said the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 
The word of God is the rhema spoken word, which is eternal, unchangeable, never comes back void. I don't believe that the word of God and scripture are the same thing. And therefore the scriptures do not teach as a doctrine, the preservation of scripture. It teaches the preservation of the word of God, the words of God, which are eternal. Here's a passage which almost specifically says what I'm trying to say. John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, the word of God. The scriptures only point to the word of God. They are not the word of God. Heresy! No. Scripture. You err not knowing your own scriptures. The scriptures are not the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, you're splitting doctrinal hairs. No. No, I'm not. I'm seeking to know the Lord Jesus, who lives. He's a living God. He lives in my soul. He lives in my heart. He loves me. He gave himself up for me. He's not a principle. He's not a bunch of data that I store in my brain, my little peanut brain. We have to relate to him. Holiness is relationship with him. He's relational. He's not intellectual. Isn't it ironic? This is an irony that God says that we should have no other gods and that many believers are so offended by the idea that someone would suggest that the Bible could be supernaturally changed. And it's because they have an idol, which is the Bible. And that Bible idol is blinding them to the truth that the Bible is changing. It's very ironic. And well, it is spoken of you, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The Bible study is an idolatrous gathering because you go in there and there's no transformation. There's no impact. There's no Holy Spirit power. There's no deliverance. It's just puffing you up with knowledge. I'm not saying it's everybody, but I think you understand. All right, last two passages here, and we're done. So I said, Lord, can you show me in the Bible, in the scripture, where I can see these two things side by side so we can see the difference between the two? And of course, he led me to Exodus 31, 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him, this is God with Moses on the mount. And when he, God, and made, made an end of speaking with him, this is the word of God, on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tables. It's not tablets, by the way. That's a Mandela effect. He gave him two tables of the testimony. That's scripture. Written with the finger of God. So there it is. The word of God and the scripture pictured side by side. One is the author of the book. The other is the book. And here's another example in Exodus 34. So Moses chiseled out two tables, which is the scripture, like the originals. He rose early in the morning Taking the two stone tables in his hands, he went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And here comes the word of God. And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed his name. Hallelujah! Then the Lord passed in front of Moses and called out, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that this event would be open to you and that what it will do for all of us is it will set us on a heart on a journey of repentance from trusting in our own intellect and trusting in a 
in a knowledge base of theology and that we would remind ourselves that there are devout Christians in foreign lands in persecuted countries that have no Bibles, yet these people are raising the dead and winning the lost and they're filled with the joy of the Lord or filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, I'm not, I'm not proposing that we don't need the Bible. I'm just saying that we don't follow a book. We follow a living God. His name is Jesus. If you've never bowed your knee to Jesus Christ, I pray for you right now that you would say to, to him, Jesus, if you're real, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to make me your own. I ask you to wash me of all my sins. Cleanse me so that I could know you. Lord Jesus, forgive me and come into my heart. Pray that prayer. Make it your own. And he will bring you to himself. And if you're a believer and you'd like to dialogue on this, my email is pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. Send me your email. Chat on the on the webs on the YouTube channel. Wake up or else. I, I read every comment, and uh, you know let's figure this out together because this is happening, and uh, it's the glory of God to conceal the matter, and the glory of kings to seek it out. I hope this has helped some, and I bless you in the name of Jesus.